a reading <clears throat> from the first book of Samuel. In those days, Hannah brought Samuel with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an epith of flour, and a skin of wine, and presented him at the temple of the Lord in Shiloh. After the boy's father had sacrificed the young bull, Hannah, his mother, approached Eli and said, Pardon, my lord. As you live, my lord, I am the woman who stood near you here, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted my request. Now I, in turn, give him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be dedicated to the Lord. She left Samuel there. The word of the Lord. My heart exalts in the Lord, my Savior. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in my God. I have swallowed up my enemies. I rejoice in my victory. The bows of the mighty are broken, while the tottering gird on strength. The well-fed hire themselves out for bread, while the hungry batten on spoil. The barren wife bears seven sons, while the mother of many languishes. The Lord puts to death and gives life. He casts down to the netherworld. He raises up again. The Lord makes the poor and makes the rich. He humbles. He also exalts. He raises the needy from the dust. From the dung heap, he lifts up the poor to seat them with nobles and make a glorious throne their heritage. Dominus Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. <clears throat> Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm, he has scattered, and has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. 
Ebum Domini. In a homily given earlier this year on the solemnity of the Assumption of Mary, Pope Francis spoke about the humility of Mary. He said, Mary's secret is humility. It is her humility that attracted God's gaze to her. The human eye always looks for grandeur and allows itself to be dazzled by what is flashy. Instead, God does not look at the appearance. God looks at the heart and is enchanted by humility. Humility of heart enchants God. That's a beautiful thought in itself. Humility of heart enchants God. And since we know that Mary was conceived without original sin, and that she remained without sin throughout her entire earthly life, then she practiced the virtue of humility with perfection. It is from the depths of a poor, lowly, meek, and humble heart, such as Mary, that we get the prayer commonly known as the Magnificat, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. In this canticle of Mary, which is prayed in the Liturgy of the Hours, every day at evening prayer, the voice of Mary echoes the prayer of every faithful Israelite who has suffered from some sort of injustice or some sort of oppression. We hear similar words from the prophets, the psalmists, and even from faithful women such as Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. Hannah was one of two women married to a man named Elkanah. Hannah was barren and so was incapable of having children, whereas the other wife, Penina, had children. Hannah's barrenness became an occasion of significant grief and suffering for her, as she desired greatly to have a child. She did not give in to envy towards the other wife, but instead humbled herself and turned to the Lord in prayer for relief. She asked the Lord to give her a child and promised to dedicate this child to the Lord's service. And when the Lord answers her prayer and gives her a son named Samuel, she utters a prayer of praise that very much resembles Mary's Magnificat. The mighty, the rich, and the arrogant are cast down, while the humble, the meek, and the lowly, and the poor are exalted. God opposes the proud and the haughty, but he is moved by the humility of his servants. There are two primary ways that the virtue of humility may grow within us. And the first, is the more painful and humiliating way. It is often the way that most of us grow in humility due to our hardness of heart. And this process of humility takes place when we undergo certain humiliations because of our arrogant behavior or our prideful thoughts or our words and actions. Whether we literally, whether literally or figuratively, God allows us to trip over ourselves, to trip over our ego, ego and fall flat on our faces. And for some of us, this happens many times throughout our lives. Whenever we tend to become too haughty or too full of ourselves, life has a way of knocking us down a few pegs. And hopefully these humiliations will help us to realize the error of our ways and become humbler instead of making us even more arrogant. The second way of growing in humility 
is often easier and less painful. But it involves our own willingness to acknowledge our sinfulness and our weakness and to humble ourselves. In other words, we are more willing to humiliate ourselves than wait for something or someone else to humiliate us. When we humble ourselves willingly, we more closely imitate the humility of Mary. We are not so concerned with external appearances of beauty as we are with interior spiritual beauty, the beauty of a, of a faithful soul that does not think too much of itself, but acknowledges reality as it is. The humble soul recognizes that nothing is possible without God, and that we are completely reliant upon his gifts and graces. The humble soul does not think or act like it knows everything, even if it has a doctoral degree. Such a soul does not perceive itself as being better than others, but rather regards itself as lower than others. St. Francis of Assisi did not think of others as greater sinners than he. Rather, he regarded himself as the greatest sinner in the world. The saints call to mind what Jesus taught about the person who takes the lowest place at the banquet, at the banquet table. He enjoys the honor of those present when the host invites them to go up to a higher place. But moving up higher is dependent upon the Lord's invitation and not by proudly imposing ourselves. In his homily on Mary's humility, Pope Francis proposes a series of questions as a means of self-reflection and examination upon our own practice of humility. He says, let us ask ourselves, each one of us in our, own, in our heart, how am I doing with humility? Do I want to be recognized by others, to affirm myself and to be praised? Or do I think rather about serving? Do I know how to listen like Mary? Or do I want only to speak and receive attention? Do I know how to keep silence, like Mary, or am I always chattering? Do I know how to take a step back, diffuse quarrels and arguments, or do I always want to excel? Let us think about these questions, each one of us. How am I doing with humility? And since none of us have been immaculately conceived like Mary, Every single one of us is in need of growth and humility in one way or another. There's no exception to that. A question we should ask ourselves is, should I take the initiative and humble myself, or should I wait for God to do it for me? In one way or another, we will be humbled. I suggest following the advice of the letter of St. James, which says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. 